fact, the modern academic field called linguistics came from the discovery of ancient Sanskrit grammar. If you look at Panini or, uh, or just, you know, the way people in ancient times in India studied language, it's completely scientific. If you look at the Sanskrit alphabet, the Sanskrit alphabet is actually a scientific uh, phonology chart. Many people, I would say, certainly many, many, many Indians, Hindu, uh, have, let's say, a feeling or a conviction that there is something unique about India, that there's something special about India. I mean, obviously, India participates in all ways in world affairs, economically, politically, culturally, and so on. And yet, so it's just another country in the world, but it's also something more. And so I would like to suggest what that unique quality is, where it's coming from. And it, it comes from something very simple. And that is uh, the most important event that ever took place on this planet uh, actually happened in India. And that most important event in the history of Earth is the fact that God came to this world and sort of landed, you know, the uh, the landing field was India. And if you, of course, if we read the Puranas and even Mahabharata and other Sanskrit literatures, we know that Krishna has come in many avatars, Vishnu, Krishna, and it's interesting because one of the one of the glories of India is that even if you go back thousands of years, uh, India had religious freedom. It was always a cosmopolitan society, going back to the Rig Veda, which is practically the oldest book in any language. And no one really knows how old it is. The Western attempt to date it is a bit silly in some ways because it's based on all kinds of assumptions, which everyone knows are not really true. Well, actually, I'll tell you how they dated very quickly. The idea is that the old uh, German Oxford Sanskritist Max Müller, he was just speculating on how old the Veda might be. And so to do this, he used a type of, um, he tried to give a certain chronology for language change. For example, if you look at any language in the world, whether it's Hindi, whether it's English or French or German or, or any language, uh, we see that languages change over time. So, for example, we have the English of, uh, let's say, Chaucer. We have the English of Shakespeare. We have Victorian English. We have modern English, which is rapidly becoming sort of a non-language. But anyway, so so if you look at language change, so Miller, he looked at language change in various languages, and he said that from the languages he knew, languages tend to change at a certain rate. So if you look at Vedic literature, if you look at the original Vedic Samhitas, the Rig uh, Yajur, Asava, and Atarva Vedas, if you look at the Brahmana literature, the Aranyakas, the Upanishads, and then uh, which are basically Shruti, and then um, you get the Puranas and Itihasa like Mahabharata, Ramayana, and so on. And then you, when you get into the Itihasa literature and Puranas, even Bhagavad Gita, you have what's called classical Sanskrit. And so there's language change. In fact, there's, you know, you can get grammar books, which are Vedic. Let's say that if you want to read the Rig Veda, and then there's classical Sanskrit. So he calculated that given the rate of language change in other languages, we can say that, let's say the, the Rig Veda Sanghita was approximately this old, and then later we get this, and later we get that. Now, even he made it very clear. He said, actually, I mean, just paraphrasing, I don't have the slightest idea how old these literatures are. This is just sort of a wild guess. But the wild guess became sort of the Bible of, you know, of Vedic chronology. And here, here are some problems with that. Number one, language is a manifestation of culture. Obviously, it's one of the key components of culture. And so we can see that different parts of the world culturally change at different rates. 
For example, India. India is practically the only civilization left on Earth which has basically retained a very ancient culture. And in, including its, you know, the religious views. I mean, people thousands of years ago were worshipping Vishnu, and people still worship Vishnu. Whereas if you look, say, at Europe, you have the Greco-Roman civilization, which spread throughout Europe, and, uh, you know, they don't worship Zeus and Jupiter and Apollo anymore. And so there's been a complete change. Actually, the word Jupiter, Sanskrit, in case you're interested, uh, Jew in Sanskrit is the, is the sort of the stem word for uh, Divya, divine, Deva, and Peter, of course, his father. So Jew, Peter, the father of heaven. But anyway, that's that's a very interesting topic. Uh, you know, the, so so in one sense, and this gets back to what I said. There's something very special and unique about Bharat Varsha, today called India, and uh, that is that God chose that place to appear in this world because if God's going to come to this world, he has to land somewhere. So and 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 actually if you look at a map of the world, if you look at a flat map of the world and kind of put aside the Western hemisphere, which is sort of way out out there, and just look at in a sense the one huge landmass, which is Eurasia and Africa, you will see that actually India is in the center of the world. And also, it was up until actually the British sort of, uh, you know, kind of did what they did best in terms of colonialism and, and you know, stripped it of all of its assets. If, if you look at, if you look before that, India had like 30, 40 percent of all the wealth in the world. As wealth was calculated then in terms of, you know, precious, semi-precious stones and food crops and, uh, textiles and just, you know, things that people wanted back then. In fact, the Roman Empire had a big trade deficit with India because there were lots of things in India they wanted and they had nothing that India particularly needed. And so Rome had to pay with gold and that was a big, you know, balance of payment problem. So you had this glorious civilization and um, as far as how old it is, uh, Western scholarship, I, I'm, I'm coming out with sort of a, um, a version of the Mahabharata, reconstructed Mahabharata, and I, I go over this. So in, in Western scholarship, they really don't know. They really don't know how old it is. For example, Aryabhata, the great mathematician astronomer, by a process called archaeoastronomy, uh, calculated that, uh, the Battle of Kurukshetra was roughly 5,100 years ago. And the way they do that is because, as you know, in India, I mean, to this day, and certainly back in ancient time, people are very concerned with astrology. And, um, of course, astrology is based on observing the night sky. And so, therefore, if you look at all these ancient texts, Mahabharata, the, the Puranas, really everything, um, they, whenever something important happens, it can be a divine birth like Janmashtami, you know, the birth of Krishna Janma or Ram Janma or, or anything or a great sacrifice or a great wedding or this or that. They always give a description of the night sky. They explain what was going on astronomically. And so therefore we have all this information. If you take that astronomical information and ask the simple question, when would the night sky have looked like that? Then Aryabhata concluded, who's, he's one of the inventors of trigonometry. He's, you know, a very smart guy. And so he calculated about, you know, roughly maybe five, actually about five, 5,123 or 24 years ago, to be more precise. Now, interesting, inter interestingly, there is a place called Ahol, A-I-H-O-L-E in India. And, uh, there was a king, Pulak, uh, II. And so he had this monument erected, inscribed in stone. And in order to explain, it's mostly about him, you know, kings are kind of uh, self-centered. But then he also wants to date it. And so he says that this inscription is being inscribed um, so many years after the Battle of Kurukshetra. And so if you compare the date, because we know when that inscription was made, and then if you add, you know, add our date to th that point, and then from that point, how many years? It turns out it's practically identical to Aryabhata. 
So anyway, so we, we have this ancient day going to language change. India has been a much more cons- culturally conservative society. Thank God someone has been. And, and so we've, you know, it's not that, so we still have all these ancient texts. We still in India, although obviously things change over time, but you can still get a picture in some ways of what the past was like. And so because cultural change has slowed down in India or just maybe artificially accelerated in other places. And so therefore you cannot assume language change is the same. Not only that, but India was by far, by far, uh, the most advanced country in the world in terms of knowledge of what you could call academic linguistics, the scientific study of language. In fact, the modern academic field called linguistics came from the discovery of ancient Sanskrit grammar. If you look at Panini or, uh, or just, you know, the way people in ancient times in India studied language, it's completely scientific. If you look at the Sanskrit alphabet, the Sanskrit alphabet is actually a scientific uh, phonology chart. If you look at English, for example, A, B, C, D. So let's just, I mean, just very quickly, phonetically, what is A, B, C, D? A is a diphthong vowel, which is for, like, why start with a diphthong vowel, A? Then you have B, which is a, um, it's a labial, it's a soft labial, but with, with a long, simple vowel, E. And then C, which is a sibilant, and D. In other words, it's just all over the place. So, so the, the Roman alphabet or the English alphabet, it has, it's just, it's from the phonetical point of view, it's kind of wild and out of control. It just goes all over the place. Whereas if you look at the Sanskrit alphabet, it's, it's scientific. It's phonology. The vowels and anyway, I won't go into the whole phonology of, of Sanskrit, but so, so they had this super understanding of language. They understood, I mean, e- even the, the, the morphology, you know, the, like, Anyway, I could just go on and on for an hour just about linguistics, but I better stop. So before you have to stop me, I'll I'll stop myself. So it's, um, so what I mean to say is a people who were so absolutely focused on language and had a scientific understanding of it thousands of years, they were thousands of years ahead of the rest of the world. And so therefore the language isn't going to change that much. It's going to change at a much slower rate because language is sacred. It's Vak. You know, it's a goddess. Language is, is, is you know, Vag Devi. It, it, language is a goddess, which is actually, a, I think, a scientific idea if you understand what they really meant. And so, so therefore, you can't calculate, you can't impose on India the same rates of language change. There's another factor why the Western dating of Sanskrit texts is, in, in a way, completely off mark. And that is that if you look at the different categories of Vedic literature, say like the 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 Sanghitas, the Rig Veda, Yajra Veda, and so on, in those texts, the power of it, the power of the text used in sacrifices, you know, great fire sacrifice, a great state uh, sacrifice like Rajasuya and so on, and other sacrifices, the power was actually in the physical sound. The power was that. So therefore, you had to memorize the sound because if you got one little sound wrong, it didn't work. It's like if you're building a computer and you put one part in the wrong place, it's like, whoops. You know, the computer doesn't work. That's the nature of technology. And so there's a famous example of this given in the Bhagavad Purana. When uh, Twashta, Twashta had a son, uh, Visarupa, who um, had three heads, which is, you know, can't imitate that. But so he was offering, he was making offerings, chanting Vedic mantras and making offerings uh, for his community, the devas. He was making offerings to the forefathers, but also because he was related in the family to the Asuras on the side, he would do a little offering for the Asuras, you know, just like for the family. So when Indra found out about this, he was outraged that, you know, you, you are making offerings to the Asuras. So he killed Visharupa. 
And of course, Twashta's father did not appreciate this. And since Twashta was also a deva, he wanted revenge. So he arranged this great Vedic sacrifice in which he would create this monster, this creature that would kill Indra. So he had to chant in order to create this creature. He had to chant that this creature will be Indra Shatru. Shatru means mortal enemy. But, you know, big sacrifice, lots of money. You've probably seen these fire sacrifices that, you know, threaten to go on literally for your entire lifetime. So, so they were chanting all these mantras and he made this one, he just misplaced an accent. Instead of saying Indra Shatru, which means Indra's mortal enemy, he said Indra Shatru, which means Indra will be the mortal enemy of this creature. And of course, that was the birth of uh, Vritra, which is also mentioned in the Rig Veda. And so just by misplacing one accent, it gave the opposite effect. So when you have this culture where the power is in the physical sound, it has to be perfect. I remember at uh, one of the most famous, what are called Vedicists, one of those funny English words, uh, you know, scholars who specifically study the Shruti literature, one of those famous and uh, accomplished scholars is uh, Michael Witzel, who is my main professor at Harvard. And I remember he used to, he often said that the memorization of the Rig Rig Veda, which is this huge work, was so perfect. He said that if you listen to a qualified person chanting today, it's exactly like having a tape recording of 5,000 years ago. So that's the, the Sanghita literature. But on the other hand, when you get to the Upanishads, Aranyakas, because in every culture, what you find is that you have a state religion, which, of course, was the Vedic Sanatan Dharma in India, in, in Israel, the Judaism in ancient times. So when you have a state religion, people who are priests in that religion are really taken care of. The king or the government you know, gives them nice facility. They arrange blessings for the, for the leaders. And so what you have is, in history, you find throughout the world that you get people who are more interested in spiritual things, and they see this as corruption because a priest who's getting a really nice income and lives in a beautiful house is not going to displease his patron. And so rather than sort of do the real, you know, quite, you know, tell the tough truth about what the king should really be doing and what spiritual life is, you just kind of, oh, yeah, you're a great king. You're amazing. So therefore, you always have a class of people who want to get away from the cities, get away from the royal capitals, and kind of get back to real spirituality, meditation, austerity. I'll give you three examples. Uh, in ancient Israel, they had this exact same problem. And so a group of people thought that the priests in Jerusalem at the temple are just really corrupted. So we have to go to the wilderness. Israel is a small country, not a lot of wilderness. So the place they chose was the Dead Sea. And those people wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were actually people who wanted to get away from the corrupt big city with the, with the fat cat priest. Now, the exact same thing you found, you found something similar in early, very early Christianity. As Christianity gradually became accepted by certain leaders, then certain Christians wanted to get away from it all, meditate, be like sort of early Christian yogis. So if you look at Egypt, if you go south in Egypt, the land starts to go up. Because and, and the Nile, you follow the Nile until it's called Upper Egypt. You get into these mountains, and of course, toward the southern end of Egypt. And so, sort of like early, I don't know, Egyptian Christian yogis, they would go to Upper Egypt to get away. In India, which is such a huge country, you had these Mahavanas, these vast forests. So people would go either to the forest, let's say these yogis, or or or. Serious spiritual people. Of course, some of them went to the mountains, but not everyone wanted to freeze up there. So you have a lot of people going to the Mahavana and those people. And, and one common Sanskrit word for forest is, uh, whoops, uh, is, uh, Aranya, you know, Vana, like Vrindavana or Vrindaranya. So because the people who went to the forest to get away and kind of be more spiritual, they wrote new books called Aranyakas. 
That's what the Aranyika literature, and that transformed into the Upanishads. Which is, so what's interesting about these Aranyakas, especially Upanishads, is it's not about getting sound perfectly chanted to get material rewards. It's about knowledge. And so you have a new, you have this class of books called the Jnana Kanda, where people wanted knowledge, not rituals. And so, so therefore, but in those books, like the Upanishads, the power was not in the sound. The power was in the idea. The power was in the idea, not in the sound. And therefore, is the idea. Now, what that means is that let's say you have, let's say, for example, going back, God only knows how long, how many thousands of years, you have people doing rituals, big rituals, usually for very wealthy people, because they were, you know, you had to, practically it was a state ritual. It cost, it would, it cost the equivalent of many millions of dollars to put on these great events. And and actually, it was part of the ancient Indian economy because what we read is that these events, the kings would give lavish charity to the Brahmins, to poor people. So these great state sacrifices were a big part. That was like the social welfare system also. But in any case, so you have one line coming down, which is the ritual line where you preserve the Sanskrit, you preserve the sound. You have another line, which is the philosophers, the mystics, the yogis, they don't care that much. They don't have to preserve every little sound because it's about ideas. It's about knowledge. And so therefore, the knowledge line changes over time because people are not focused on the language. They're focused on the ideas. Whereas on the other side, the ritual Sangita side, the language doesn't change because if you change it, it has no power. And so therefore, along come these Western scholars thousands of years later and say, hey, this language is older than that language. Therefore, these Vedic Sanghitas are older and these Upanishads are, are, are younger because they don't understand. Anyway, that's just one example. So because of India's cultural conservatism, because of the different purposes and requirements for different lines of ancient Sanskrit literature, you get the appearance that one is older. So, but, but but getting back to the main point, so if you look at world religions, if you look at them, when I say the great world religions, I don't mean great in terms of philosophical marvels. I mean, in terms of historical influence. I'm using the word great in a neutral sense of historical influence. A claim is made. Sanatan Dharma, culture, or Indian Vedic, and the word Hindu is a very new term. I could explain that. It's actually, it's about 200 years old. But anyway... So, but the Sanatan Dharma culture is the only religion in the world that makes a particular claim. And that is that God himself or herself, you know, also Radha, Krishna, Lakshmi Narayan, Sita Ram, and so on, actually came to this world and lived a life, not just one epiphany, like a, like a burning bush in the Old Testament, not just one revelation and then he's gone, but actually lived in this world. If you look at Christianity, of course, the Son of God, he kept getting upgrades as that's a whole other story until he became, you know, also God, co-God with, you know, other people like the Father and the Holy Ghost. So, you know, you get all these upgrades, but, but before the upgrades, if you look at Christianity at the time when Jesus was actually alive, of course, it wasn't called Christianity then. If you look at the Jesus movement when Jesus was alive, and if you look at all the, the teachings of the people that actually knew Jesus, that actually knew him, or knew people that knew him, no one said he was God. That came later. So you have this claim that, you know, the Son of God, and then you have the prophet, of course. In Islam, you have the prophet. In Judaism, you have, you know, God sometimes communicates with humans. Otherwise, you have prophets. You have patriarchs. And matriarchs, but the idea that the supreme God, as as it said in in Brahma Sutras, Vedanta Sutra, that Janma Dyasya Jataha, the source of everything, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Aham Sarvasya Prabhava, I am the source of everything. Mattak Sarvam Pravartate, everything emanates from me. Iti Matva Bhajante Mang, those who understand this worship me. Buddha Bhava Samandi, uh, intelligently, rationally. This is for, so India, 
from India, Bharat Varsha, you get this unique claim. It's not like, well, everyone says that. No, no one says that. No one says that God came to this world, lived a full life. You know, the Father, God the Father. Krishna, three times in the Gita, Krishna is referred to as a father. Krishna once says, Pitaha Masya Jagato, I'm the father of this universe. He says that, um, Ahang Bija Pradak Pita, I am the father that gives the seed for all life. And Arjuna, Arjuna in chapter 11 of the Gita says, uh, Pita Silo Kasya Chara Charasya, that you are the father of this entire universe. So, and not only Krishna came once, but many times. These are the avatars. Now, what's interesting, as we know, in India, there was always religious and intellectual freedom, which put it way above a lot, you know, most other places. And uh, so there, you know, there are different approaches. You know, some people are Shaiva, some people are Shakta. And that's all, you know, it's all part of the same culture. But what's interesting is the notion of God coming to this world and do, like the Dashavatar. And that's only 10. That's just sort of like the, you know, avatars for dummies. You know, it's, it's just a short list. But actually, there are many, many avatars. That's uniquely something from Vishnu or Krishna. In fact, if you look at Indian history, sort of like keeping up with the Dasas, you know, keeping up. So other schools in India, which are also, of course, we respect, but they tried to come up with their own avatar theology, but it, it just didn't fly. It never really caught on because you can't make it up. You can't just, you know, do it because, okay, they have avatar. We want avatars. And so the real avatar understanding, it's something which comes from Vishnu and Krishna. So there's, if you look at the, the most powerful, historically influential books in Indian history, they're Vaishnava books. You have, you have Mahabharata, in which Krishna speaks Bhagavad Gita. You know, there may be stotras, stutis to this great personality, and they are great personalities, or that one. But as far as who really is making everything happen, it's Krishna. That's Mahabharata. If you look at Ramayan, Ram, of course, is one of the Dashavataras, the Ramayan, the Mahabharata, Bhagavad Gita. There is no, there are no books in all of Indian history. You can go back millions of years, which have the historical cultural influence of Bhagavad Gita, Ramayana, Mahabharata. If you look at Indian cultural production, in, the, in terms of, let's say, sculpture, theater, uh, painting, everything, music, festival. If you look at all the different forms of cultural production, uh, the influence of Mahabharata, Ramayana is just unique. There's, there's nothing comparable to it. So India, I mean, it, it, it's not a, the idea that, that Krishna in his avatars has come to that, you know, Punya Bhumi to that sacred land, it's not a sectarian idea. I mean, he has to come somewhere. And, you know, if you come to one place and you come again, because there has to be cultural continuity. You can't, like, start over every time Every time there's a new avatar. You can't start all over. And so the, the, the obvious need to have one place where the avatars come is that each time the avatar comes, that place is already culturally prepared. You don't start from, from zero. And so Bharat Varsha, in that sense, I mean, one sense, yeah, it's a material country. It has a geography. It has a history. It has politics. Whew, we know about that. So it has politics. You know, it has, it has a whole economic dimension. You know, in every way it has, you know, India's got talent. There's Bollywood. So basically India is a big, important country that has all the features of the modern country. At the same time, there's something else in the background, and that is it's actually the spiritual center of the planet. And, and that gets to the other topic, which is, you know, what is India's role now? I mean, obviously, I'm personally very happy that the Indian, Indian economy is now the fastest growing economy. The fact that India has become a tech center of the world, the fact that there are so many, you know, very intelligent, very educated younger generations, Indians. I think that's all very positive. I, I think it's really great, you know, finally getting past the post-colonial kind of, you know, stupor and actually 
you know, and actually, um, you know, India taking its rightful place, the, the place it always had through history, pre-colonial history, as, you know, a, a, a very powerful cultural center of the world. I mean, that's why we have, that's why you find Sanskrit names all over Southeast Asia. You know, you don't have a record of India invading other countries, and yet you have Singapore, the Lion City, right? Singapore, you have in the largest island in the uh, the Indone- in Indonesia is Sumatra, which is Sanskrit. It means very big, the biggest island. You have the island of Bali. You have the old name for Thailand, which is uh, uh, Siam, Shama. And so the reason you find Sanskrit names, the reason if you go to Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia, in the center of the city, you have a big statue of Partha Sarathi, Krishna driving Arjuna's chariot, is because just by its superiority, Indian culture spread in many places. And uh, we, I mean, we can talk about how it spread even to Anatolia, which is today Turkey, how there was a, an ancient kingdom called Mitanni, and they signed a peace treaty with the Hittites many, many thousands of years ago, and it survived. And so, you know, th- these are all the conditions of the treaty. And to make sure no one cheats, you're signing the treaty in the name of the God, because if you cheat, you know, really bad things will happen to you. And so what's interesting is that the last eight names of gods in the peace treaty are uh, the gods of the Rig Veda, Indra, Varuna, and so on. And the last eight make the total number of gods 108. You know, it's it's also interesting. I mean, we go on and on with this. It's also interesting that, um, what was I going to say that, uh, yes, if you look at the first great Persian emperor, who's called Cyrus the Great, here are some interesting facts, unknown facts about Cyrus the Great. First of all, he was great because he abolished slavery, which is like, what? You know, he abolished slavery throughout the empire. And by the way, Megasthenes, the ancient uh, Greek ambassador to Pataliputra under the Mauryan, said India was the only place without slavery. And so, um, so Cyrus the Great abolished slavery. He declared religious freedom, religious freedom. And he even, he's considered a messiah in the Old Testament because he allowed the Jews to leave Babylonia, where they'd been taken as sort of, well, not slaves, but sort of definitely, you know, serving class. He let them go back to Israel, gave them money to help rebuild their temple. And he was the only, practically the only ancient leader that everyone respected. Now, here are the facts about Cyrus. For one thing, Cyrus spoke a dialect, dialect of Sanskrit. Because he was, you know, Zoroastrian. And if you look at that ancient Persian language, it is a dialect of Sanskrit. In fact, when I was at Harvard, scholars who studied ancient Persian were in the Sanskrit department. And uh, anyway, so another fact is that uh, his name was not actually Cyrus. There's a whole CK thing. If you look at these ancient languages, it's a typical, they call it centum kentum, that sometimes they pronounce the C like K, sometimes they pronounce it like the S, like in English, you say ten cents or color. So, so that, so Cyrus actually, in his own lang- in his own language, which was a dialect of Sanskrit, was a Kuru. And Kuru, of course, is a very, very prominent name of kings in Vedic culture. So, so the influence of Anyway, we know there was trade, for example, these uh, Harappan seals, these little seals from the Indus Valley Civilization. They found little seals of Lord Shiva in Denmark. But it goes on and on. And, and we, so, but the point I want to get to is that India culturally had a, a very powerful influence uh, in ancient times. And it was... I think without question, the spiritual center of the world. It, it um, There was always religious freedom. And so what about today? What is India's role today? I think obviously India has to, uh, you know, we can't, all the H- Indians can't just sort of, you know, give up technology and make Kadi cloth. So, I mean, clearly, I, I, I think for its own, my view is for its own, obviously for its own security. For its own security, economic security and military security, which are not separable as we know. 
Um, I'm personally very happy that India is really rising in the sense of, of and, and more and more becoming a powerful country in the world. Because I think India is probably one of the countries in the world that could that can handle power in a way which doesn't cause all kinds of disasters in the world. Other countries, when they get power, it seems like they can't control themselves. So, and and India has a unique spiritual message to give. Even like yoga, for example, you know, which is spread all over the Western world. I mean, I mean, you know, every little city in Mississippi has a yoga school. So, nothing wrong with Mississippi. I don't mean to offend the good people of Mississippi. Actually, when I was, you know, many, many years ago, I used to, in the 70s, early 70s, I used to travel around to American universities to give lectures. And one of the best programs we ever had, chanting Hare Krishna, explaining Bhagavad Gita, was at the University of Mississippi, which is interesting. So, India has this unique, it's like if you have knowledge, for example, with this COVID disaster. So, if some country develops um, uh, a, a vaccine, like India had it, it's, it's vaccine diplomacy, right? And so that's what good human beings do. If you have knowledge and other people don't have it, you try to share it. And so um, India has this unique spiritual understanding because Bhagavan, Sri Krishna, Parameshwar, whatever word you want to use, actually appeared in South Asia. And practically, I mean, India, the whole subcontinent is practically almost like this wall to wall holy places because, you know, everywhere you go, it's hard to go anywhere in India where something amazing didn't happen in terms of avatars and, and, and something. I mean, something happened everywhere. Oh, I was sharing with, um, I was sharing with you that um, the first time I flew to India, the first time I actually in this life went to India, uh, Rutuja, the first time I went to India as, as the plane, you know, because I'm a geographer, I always like to calculate geography. And so as, as we sort of entered Indian airspace and we were coming from Europe, flying over Northwest India, I looked down and I had this very powerful experience that I could practically see that the Pandavas and Krishna actually walked on that land. And so, um, so in that sense, India, but in order for India to play the role, which I'm quite sure it's destined to play, because the world, as we know, is a huge mess. It's just chaos now. It's just chaos. And, uh, so India has this extraordinary wisdom. This extraordinary knowledge. It really is. I know this is not politically correct, but, you know, there's a long, very long list of things that are true, but not politically correct. So, but the fact is that um, India is the spiritual center of the world. Actually, one time when I was with Prabhupada, I was spending time with him in Mayapur in, in West Bengal, and uh, it was Gaur Purnima. It was the Avir Bhav uh, Mahotsav Diti. It was, it was the Appearance Day celebration of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And there were actually, it was in the evening, the sun had gone down, and there were literally hundreds of thousands of Bengalis just pouring into our, we have a large, you know, very large ashram there. That's actually more like a little town now. And there were just hundreds and hundreds of thousands just coming in to get the Takur Darshan, as they say there. And so um, I, I'd never seen that many human beings in one place in my life. And they were, they were all coming to see, to see Krishna. And so uh, Prabhupada, I, Prabhupada was also in the balcony, it's a big balcony. So I, I walked over to Prabhupada and I said that uh, India is an amazing place. And that was back in 1975, I think. So I was 26 years old. You know, never ask a lady or a sannyasi their age. So anyway, 
So I said, I said to Prabhupada, I said to Prabhupada, um, India is an amazing place. And Prabhupada looked at me as if what I'd done was, as the, the old saying goes, damnation by faint praise. In other words, that I, I'd said much too little. So Prabhupada looked at me and said, it is the most important place in the universe. And that, of course, gets into the Mahabharata. And we could talk for weeks and weeks about the Mahabharata, which I'm going to publish very soon, sort of this reconstructed, taking real history much more seriously, Mahabharata, which I think is actually much more interesting than Amar Chitra Kata. So, but India, I mean, India is not only the spiritual center of this planet, and I think I give very logical, objective arguments for that, but even within the world, that they used to say Sri Loka, you know, the three worlds, that it, it, it plays a unique role. It plays a unique role. And so, um, but in order for India to, because I don't think any other culture or any other place can really fix this planet. And uh, so it, w w what's essential is the Sanatana Dharmi. Okay, I'll just tell you for just three minutes and I will take a question. But the word Hindu, this is like really short version. The word Hindu comes from a Sanskrit word, Sindhu. And, uh, of course, the great Sindhu River, which was a boundary on the west side of the Sindhu was the Persian Empire. And on the east side of the Sindhu was the Sanatana Dharma culture. So they had this uh, interesting speech pattern on the Persian side where they pronounced an, an, an S as an H. So Sindhu became Hindu. And Hindu basically referred just, it was a geographic term. It referred to everyone east of the river. You find this S to H in other words, like, for example, we have the English prefix homo, like homogeneous. That's Sanskrit samo. Like Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, samo hang sarva bhuteshu, I'm equal to all living beings. So from samo, you get homo. Or for the last one, so, so the god of Zoroastrianism, Ahura Mazda, it's asura in, 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 in Sanskrit. Not the asura bad guy thing. It's the word asu is a synonym of prana. And so Asura is sort of like God who gives life and gives prana to everyone. And so anyway, so what happened is that with the Muslim invasions, you know, those amazing events, sort of unforgettable events, with, with the Muslim invasions of India, uh, they brought this speech pattern. They brought this word into India, Hindu. Now, for the Muslims, Hindu was anyone that wasn't a Muslim. So if you were an Indian Buddhist, or if you were an Indian Vaishnav, or if you were an Indian Tantric, or whatever you were, if you weren't Muslim, you were a Hindu. And so if you look at Indian literature, let's say from medieval India, like the Chaitanya Charitamrita, what you find is that Indians who are Sanatana Dharmi, they only use the word Hindu they only use the word when they're talking to Muslims. Because the Muslims were, uh, you know, a bit violent and, you know, and they gained power. So there, if someone's calling you something and that person is violent and has power over you, you kind of refer to yourself in the same way. So what we find is that at that point in Indian history, no one in India who's a Sanatana Dharmi refers to themselves as a Hindu, when they're speaking to other Sanatana Dharmi, they don't use the word. They only use it when they're talking to Muslims. Because that's what the Muslims call them. Then, what happened is about uh, maybe 150 you know, years ago to 120 years ago, there was actually this conscious plan that because India had been conquered successively by sort of fanatical, by by by. Uh, people with fanatical Middle Eastern religions, namely Islam and then Christianity, were trying to convert everybody. Therefore, some people in India thought, well, you know, the problem in India is we have religious so much, you know, everyone, someone's a Shaiva, Shakta, Tantrika, this, that, the other thing. You know, there's like a million different things here because they have so much freedom, because of the freedom. So therefore, to compete, to keep up with the Joneses, so to speak, you know, we've got to also have one sectarian religion. And you can actually study, there, there's a great book on this by William Halfuss, who was a prominent scholar at the University of Pennsylvania. He wrote a book called India and Europe, in which he shows, he traces, 
people like Vivekananda and uh, that um, Dr. Radha Krishnan. I mean, you can trace it in their lectures and their writings. They very consciously decided to create a sectarian religion that could compete with Christianity. And so therefore, they, and they decided, okay, we'll call ourselves Hindu. Now, the idea that someone in India who accepts the Vedas, first definition of a Hindu, by the way, and a decision by the Indian Supreme Court, when they had decided because of certain legal matters, uh, the Vedas, so, so to be a Hindu, you have to accept the Vedas, but the Vedas don't accept the word Hindu. So you have this very ironic thing. I mean, there is obviously a great spiritual tradition of Sanatana Dharma. I'm not denying that. It's just the word Hindu is not the historical word. And so, um, so they say, okay, we're Hindus. And then they said, and this was completely bizarre, that well, if we're going to be one religion, we have to have uh, we have to have some kind of theology, right? Because religions have theology. So they say, well, why not Shankara? Now it's very interesting because Adi Shankara, first of all, even from the point of view of Western scholars, really kind of twisted his interpretations. He's he's not really looking at what the Sanskrit says, like the Upanishad. For example, his whole thing is Jnana Khand. Everything is Jnana. And so therefore, in one Upanishad commentary, you have the word tapas, or tapasya, which means austerity, simple Sanskrit word. It comes from the root tap, which means to heat, like the heat, you know, the fire of austerity. So Shankar says, okay, tapasya means gyan. No, it doesn't. That's absurd. Tapasya means tapasya. And so anyway, so I say, we'll take Shankar. The problem is that the largest, the, the largest part of Hinduism, so-called, is Vaishnavism, Rama, Krishna, Bhagavad Gita, all that stuff, Mahabharata, and which completely rejects the idea of Shankara that there's no supreme personal deity. So, so they take Shankara because it was kind of Shankara was very popular among intellectuals and they were kind of intellectuals. So then what happened? So then there was a lot of protests historically about that. So now, for example, I've often spoken in Hindu mandirs in America, give lectures. And so I've gone to mandirs where they have this big color poster on the wall explaining this is what Hinduism is. And so basically they have this pantheon. They have all these gods, or Shiva, Krishna, Vishnu, this, that, the other thing. And then it says, of course, but really, ultimately, there's just an Ishwara that has no name or form. Where in the world does that come from? I mean, that's not in the Bhagavad Gita. That's not in the Mahabharata. That's not in the Ramayana. I mean, so, so therefore, I think the real point is that it, it's almost like I feel the people in India are sitting on this treasure. It's like you have the, you, you know, you have this rich uncle you don't know about, and there's actually a trust fund for you for billions of dollars, but you actually don't know it. So you never, you know, you can't spend the money. So in the same way, India is sitting on this incredible treasure of knowledge, and yet over time, the knowledge has been uh, corrupted. And the authority we have that in any country, really, but over time in India, knowledge tends to be corrupted over time. And the authority for this is Krishna himself, because Krishna says in, in, in the Bhagavad Gita, Imang vivasvate yogam proktavanaham abhiyam. I spoke this unperishing knowledge. It doesn't change over time. It doesn't change because Vivekananda or Dr. Radha Krishnan have some kind of political strategy. So Krishna says, I spoke the spiritual science, which is abhyayam. It never changes. And vivasan manade praha. Vibhasan spoke, spoke to his son, Manu, Manu Ishaka Manu spoke to Ishaka. Then Krishna says, Evam param para praptam imang raja sayo The knowledge comes in this succession and all the great sages and kings understood it, but sakale neha mahata joga nashta parantapa. Krishna says that sa, this knowledge, kalena, by time, Iha in this world, Mata, by great time, the, the, the knowledge was nashta, it was lost. 
Sukale neha mahata yoga nashta parantapa. Therefore, saivaya mayate. Therefore, today I am again speaking to this knowledge to, to recover the original understanding. And so if we look at what Bhagavad Gita actually says, and not what so many people in their imagination think it says, if you actually look at the Sanskrit words of Bhagavad Gita, it's very different. If you compare Bhagavad Gita to what a lot of people say Hinduism is, it's like, it's not even close. For example, you read any textbook on earth on Hinduism, like for, you know, world religions class or introduction to Asian religions or something, in every textbook in English, the first thing we'll say is, or very soon we'll say, in Hinduism, people are not so concerned with uh, theology, orthodoxy, which means correct thinking. It's about orthopraxis. So if you go to, I know in the West, if you go to a, a Hindu event, say a little celebration, and they have all the lights on the big, you know, on the big tray, and then they, you know, Jaya Jagati Shahare, they do that. And so... If you do that, you know, if you swing the plate and you, you know, touch the fire, no one could care less what your philosophy is. And so this is not Bhagavad Gita. Krishna specifically says in Bhagavad Gita, in verse 433, that uh, Shaya Jnana Maya, uh, uh, no, Shaya uh, that better than worshiping God by rituals is worshiping God by developing your knowledge, by understanding the philosophy that Krishna himself taught. And then Krishna says, Sar, uh, uh, Sarvaki Langpartha, Jnane Parisamapyate. Uh, sarvam karmaki lang, because all ritual, all activities ultimately are meant to lead to knowledge. So basically this idea of no, just ortho, just get the ritual right. No one cares what your philosophy is. It is practically decapitated Sanatan Dharma. And, and if you look at the Indian tradition, they have the greatest scholars in the world, the greatest philosophers. I mean, Shankara, whatever one may say, was a great intellectual. He, you know, he was a very sophisticated thinker. Ramanuja. I mean, there's just, India has this glorious, unique, intellectual, philosophical tradition. And so, the, and to decapitate it by saying that, no, it's just about the ritual. And yet that's what you read in every textbook on Hinduism. So for in order for India to play its role in the world, they have to kind of, you know, get back to their real culture, the real Sanatana Dharma culture. Anyway, maybe I'll finally stop. And uh, so if you have any questions, but th those are just some, um, because and if India does that, it will, it's needed. I don't see any other country in the world that can lead this planet back to sanity. You talked about the importance of uh, how you have to enhance your knowledge, uh, ultimately. So, so in the real Sanatan Dharma culture, what is the importance of karma kanda, like rituals and all? Are yeah. they really important or is there no importance to them? Very good question. Krishna talks about this actually in chapter 3 of the Gita. He talks a lot about this. And this is basically what Krishna explains. People in general are attached to material things. People in general are attached to material because People in general are tend to identify with their bodies. You know, the very first instruction is we are not the body, we are eternal soul, Atma. That's the first Krishna's first teaching in the Gita. So what do you do with all these millions and billions of people who are really attached to their body? If you tell them, no, just, you know, become a yogi, you know, vairagya, good luck. You know, people are just not going to do it. And so therefore, Krishna says, that you have to encourage these people. You can't tell them not to act in the world. You can't tell them not to pursue their careers, not to be attached to their families. You can't just tell them that. 
And, and so Krishna says, in fact, in verse 333, Sadrasham Prakritir Jnana Even even a person that has knowledge acts according to their own nature. And most people's nature is to get married, is to have children, is to work in the world, is to have a nice house, and so on. And so Krishna says that you should Joshayat Sarva Karmani, encourage people, yes, do these things, but do it in a spirit of karma yoga. Now, in India, there's among the uh, many uh, amazing misunderstandings, there's the idea that, let's say, if, if you work and you have a job, and rather than just, you know, taking all the money and I don't know, going to Las Vegas or something, or Mumbai, you know, you, uh, you know, you take all this money and you, um, you know, you take care of your family. You're just, a, you know, you're a faithful parent and a wife or husband. Then you're a karma yogi. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, it, I mean, believe me, that's better than nothing. I mean, being a good husband or wife, mother, father is a thousand times better than being, you know, I don't know, just a you know, complete rogue. However, the word yoga means link. So karma yoga literally means that by doing what you do, you are linking yourself to God, not just your own kids. So, and what is the link? Krishna says that, that when you receive gifts, because the gifts we receive, they're not coming from your spouse. You know, if you're healthy, if, if God is blessing you with prosperity or with a good education, I mean, you know, that's not coming from your kids. That's coming from God. And so Krishna said, if you receive these gifts and you don't offer back, Krishna, you know, tough, tough love here. Krishna says, if you receive the gifts that come from me through the devas, through the devas, we receive so many gifts coming from God. Krishna says, actually coming from me. Mayaiva bihitan hitan. All these things are actually coming from me. This is real Bhagavad Gita. Then Krishna says, someone who doesn't offer back, is nothing but a thief. Chor, you have this word chor. So stena is Sanskrit, thief. Stena eva, nothing but a thief. So your karma, if you, if, if I work hard in the world, of course I would never do that, but, you know, sannyasi, but, but let's say some, (laughs) That took sannyas. The rest of my life, free lunch. So anyway, um, so let's say someone is a grihasta, and they work hard, and they they take their responsible family person, they take care of the family. Um, that's karma. Because if you do not take care of your family, that's not even karma. That's v karma. That's just like crazy activity. V karma, or or papa karma. Or douche karma. So the word karma refers to civilized behavior. So if, if you're earning money and, and, and using it for your family, you're not a karma yogi, you're a karmi. Very important distinction that's been lost in India. Now, if you take that and you offer it to Krishna, to God, that then there's yoga. You're connecting yourself to God. Now, what does it mean to offer to Krishna? It doesn't mean that you and your family starve or, or you know live on, under a big piece of cardboard in the street. Because as we know, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that you offer your food to me. I think in the history of India, there's never been one case where someone offered food to Krishna and then it disappeared off the altar and, and the person starved. Right? I mean, in the history of India, <laughs> every time someone has taken some food and offered to Krishna, it stayed there. And then you get to eat it. So, so this is the analogy with food. It's the same with your house. Being a karma yogi doesn't mean give away your house. It means, yes, have a nice house. And, but understand not that, okay, in a little closet somewhere, a little shelf, I put a little morty. You know, I live in the master bedroom and Krishna gets, you know, a little, like a tiny closet. No, it means that it's not that. God is living in your house, you are living in God's house. And therefore, uh, you know, make a nice arrangement for Krishna. Of course, you live there, you sleep there, you eat there, you own the house legally, 
your children inherit the house, all that goes on, but you understand that you are living in Krishna's house. That is karma yoga. So they've kind of gotten it backwards. So what people in India often call uh, karma yoga is actually karma. And people who are not responsible people, they're not even, they're not even karmis. They're, they're just fools. And uh, one more thing you mentioned about the uh, uses of word Hindu uh, instead of uh, Sanatana Dharmi. So how do you think of uh, using word India instead of Bharata? Shall we get uh, back to Bharata? That's very interesting. Yeah. I mean, even I, I mean, all of us sometimes have to use the word Hindu. It's not that it's an evil word. It's not, it's not evil. It's just historically inaccurate. And so a lot of times when I'm talking to people, I say Hindu because otherwise you just can't communicate with them. And, and as far as uh, Bharat and India, it's very, you take the word Sindhu and you go west of the river and the S becomes an H. It becomes Hindu. Now you keep moving to the west. The next door neighbor is the Greek world. And in Greek, an H at the beginning of a word is not pronounced, like in the word honor, like on your honor or what or how many hours, hour, honor. And so the Greek don't pronounce the H. And so Hindu, so Hindu becomes Hindu. That's where you get India. And so, um, yeah, what are you going to do? I mean, that's just the name it has in the world. So I think, I don't think I'm going to change that. I'm not going to, I don't think I can write to Google Maps and tell them, could you please put Bharata? So also another problem is that Bharata includes Pakistan and, uh, you know, other places. So, um, so I think for now we just have to go with India. I mean, actually, this is very interesting in, um, even in Sanskrit, in the, in the, they recognize this in, in the, in the Sanskrit culture, they recognize that there is what they call paramartika, uh, paramartika and vyavaharika situation. So you have paramartha, which is the highest truth or the highest meaning, paramartha. So the paramartha is that we are not these bodies. We are eternal souls. India is actually Bharat Varsha and so on. That's paramartha. But then there's the word vyavahara in Sanskrit means a sort of ordinary social dealing, vyavahara. So vyavahari, for example, if I'm applying to go to a university and it says birth date and I, I, I quote the Gita, the jayate vriyate va kadach, and the soul is never born, the soul never dies. I mean, there's actually some pretty comical stories, like in the early days of the Hare Krishna movement, we were all very young and kind of like almost unbelievably naive. So, like, let's say we'd be on the street chanting Hare Krishna. I mean, there's, I mean, there's unlimited humor in the early Hare Krishna movement. I mean, so let's say we were on the street, and then so some reporter come up and say, where are you from? And so the devotee would say, Krishna Loka. You know, I have Krishna. <laughs> and so the reporter would say, no, yeah, I understand you have your religious ideas, but where are you from? <laughs> so, I mean, it's, just, it's sort of comical. So, so in the, you know, the good news is that in the ancient Sanskrit culture, they had common sense. And so they recognize that there is, you know, there is Vyavaharika situations where you just have to go along with, you know, the customs of the world. Is that when did the concept of Brahman actually uh, materialize in the, uh, in the Indian uh, Sanatana uh, culture? Yeah, that is based on a misunderstanding of uh, history. That idea. Yeah, and it, it's oh, you probably weren't there, so I'll I'll do it very briefly because I don't want to. Uh, Not it. So, it, it, you have different lines of Sanskrit literature, Sanghitas, Rig Veda, and so on, all the uh, the Veda Sanghitas, and then you have the wisdom literature, knowledge literature, like Upanishads. And so, in the wisdom literature. I'm sorry, in the ritual literature, like the Vedic Sanghitas, uh, the powers and the sounds, they preserve the exact language going back. God only knows how far. Whereas on the knowledge, the Jnanakanda, the knowledge side, the power was not in the language itself. The power was in the ideas. And so therefore the language kind of adapted. It's just like now we're speaking contemporary English. And whereas if we were having this conversation, let's say 200 years ago, our English would be a little different. 
five, if it was during Shakespeare's time, it would be very different. So therefore, just as we say, okay, Shakespeare lived before, let's say, Charles Dickens or Jane Austen, my favorite author. So uh, let's say that, and, and why do we say that? Because we can say the language. That if you look at the language of, of um, Shakespeare, it's older English than the language of, say, the 1800s or the language of today. So if you look at India and you see older language in the, in the Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, especially Rig Veda, and then, you know, later language, say the Upanishads that have Brahman. The Upanishads are all about Brahman. That's why I bring, so I bring it up. But because the ideas, not the precise language is important, therefore the knowledge, because it was an oral tradition, neither the Mahabharata nor the Bhagavatam mention anyone. No one writes anything. It's an oral culture. Brilliant. You know, it's a genius culture. And that's why, but the, it was oral. And so therefore, as this knowledge comes down, the Upanishads, or even some Aranyagas, as this knowledge comes down, um, they just speak it in contemporary English. For example, my guru, Prabhupada, spoke English that he learned. Uh, he was born in 1896. And so in the, in the very early part of the, you know, right around the turn of the century, he was learning English as it was spoken in West Bengal, uh, you know, 100 years ago. My language is somewhat different. They're both English, but I speak in the way I learned, you know, California kid. And so, um, but we're saying the same thing. And so, I, you know, I don't have to speak English as Prabhupada spoke it, as he learned it, it you know, at the turn of the century in the early part of... So in the same way, the philosophers, the great thinkers in the Vedic culture as they were transmitting to their disciples, you know, from guru to shisha, and the shisha becomes the next guru. As they were transmitting this knowledge, everyone just spoke it in the language of their time. And so, and so at a certain point, say roughly about 2,000 years ago, maybe a little more than 2,000 years ago, uh, people start writing these things down in India. And so once, once let's say, all these shastras are written down, they're kind of like frozen. It, it still meanders a bit because there's different regions. And what you find is in India, as you know, every Indian state practically has its own language, except, well, actually, you have Madhya Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh, but, but most Indian states, you know, have their own language. And, and they have their own alphabet. They still do their own alphabets. I mean, if you look at, for example, like uh, Telugu, it's like, because I had to transliterate it from my doctoral dissertation. It's like, my God, where did all these bubbles come from? You know, because I, I was looking at the... <laughs> The Telugu script. So I have I have very good friends from from that speak Telugu, but so so therefore, as the Mahabharata, let's say, or as the Upanishads, we're talking to say the Upanishads, as they're written down, they're written down in versions which are mutually unintelligible to different parts of India because they're written in different languages. People in Uttar Pradesh don't often learn how to write in, let's say, Malayalam. It's like, oh my God, you know. So, so therefore, uh, at that point, the, the what? So, so in a sense, when you look at the text, you're getting texts which were kind of frozen in time or semi-frozen when writing became very widespread in India. So, if you look at the Upanishads, let's say the language where it kind of got written down, what we're really looking at is um, Sanskrit that was commonly spoken by Brahmins in India roughly 2,000 years ago. But the Upanishads are much older than that. But again, the language changes, but the ideas don't change. So along come the Western scholars who are very eager to shrink the uh, historical horizon of India because, you know, old is gold. So if something's really old, it has more prestige. So it's, it's like this, you know, all hands on deck to minimize the importance of Indian culture. And so, therefore, they have this real vested interest for many things. First of all, they did it because, because ancient history, the official version of ancient history up until the 1800s in Europe was the Old Testament. And the Old Testament gave a certain time frame. And so, therefore, all of India's, you know, God only knows how old Indian culture is. It had to be forced into an Old Testament time frame. And therefore, it had to be much shorter. 
And then when Christianity fell out of favor in the Western Academy, but they still liked the idea that it wasn't too old because that way, because they had the Indo-European problem. The Indo, where, where, oh my God, Sanskrit is a, an Indo-European language. And so if Indians have been in India forever, it means that Europeans must have come from India. Like, no way, we're not coming from India. Especially because even when Christianity was no longer the driving force in Western historical analysis, uh, racism was. And so if you look at the 1800s, like, there's no way we're coming from dark Indians. So there's all these, like, extremely non-academic issues that are influencing things. And then... By the time you get to the 20th century, it's just like they're not going to change. They don't want India to have the prestige. Sanskrit's not the original language. India is not the original homeland of this Indo-European culture. And so there's, and so if you look at the scholarship, what, what people like, anyway, they're just names, but like Bryant or Mallory, these really, you know, like most, like, like highly respected Indo-European scholars, what they all admit is we haven't got the slightest idea where this all comes from. So it, it so it's just it's really just political. I mean I mean just like nowadays if you go to Western universities you, you just get shoved down your throat all this you know political correctness, and the political correctness includes always bashing you know like sort of like you know what they what they call Hindu nationalism. Although if you actually look at what's going on in India, there's a type of nationalism in India which is not fanatical religious. It's not just so, so there's even the idea of like, you know, in West, Western Academy, like, like the victims are always Muslims and the oppressors are always the Hindus. I mean, I mean, that's just an example of how Western academics tends to be highly politicized. So anyway, I write about this a lot in my introduction to my Mahabharata reconstruction, but I explain in more in detail about this. So therefore, getting back to your question, uh, Indira, get, getting, Getting back to your question, um, this sort of like, you know, changing the West, I think for a long time has had this determination that India shall not be very old. And, you know, whether it was make it fit into the Old Testament, whether it was making it, you know, justify colonialism, whether it was kind of like Marxist, you know, that, that, you know, minorities in India are always right and majority group is always wrong. You know, whatever the intellectual flavor of the month is, you know, Christianity or um, or racism or Marxism, you know, it's just like it's the flavor of the month in the Western Academy. So therefore, they they were determined that it can't be that old. So therefore, they take a theory about how old the Vedas are, which the person that created the theory, Max Miller, said, I haven't got the slightest idea. This is, this is a wild guess. And suddenly it's, it's now orthodoxy. So, therefore, my point is that, that the Brahman, to now I you know, gave you the scenic route here, but if you look at the concept of Brahman, I mean, Brahman is eternal. Brahman is eternal, and knowledge of it is eternal. Uh, Krishna says in the Gita that the, that the yoga, the spiritual science, has been lost. He's reviving it. So Krishna, who according to Aryabhata, according to other things, we spoke the Gita around 5,000 years ago. And Krishna says that I'm speaking something that is much, much, much older, but was lost over time. So, and Krishna mentioned Brahman all over the place. So if we take Krishna seriously, and I, you know, I take Krishna seriously, I'm a, uh, anyway, so I'm a Hari Krishna. So, so therefore, if we if we take Krishna's words seriously, uh, it just goes back forever, and that gets into all kinds of issues like uh, you know Krishna's Maya, you know you, uh, Maya, Mahamaya. Krishna says, "Daivin yesha gunamai, daivi yesha gunamai, mama Maya duratyaya." That this divine energy of mine called Maya is dur ati aya, hard to go over, hard to, to get across. But mom, mom, eva, j, prapadyante, mayam, etam, tarantite. Those who surrender to me can easily, they cross over this maya. So what about the role of Krishna? 
Now, you know, it's just like in a, in, in, a, in a cricket match, if someone comes in there with a bazooka and shoots the ball over the wall, you know, that's not fair. It's against the rules. So in academia, it's like little children, like right? you can't play, you know, like the older kids can't play in the younger kids game. Like get out. We don't want you to play. And so, you know, the rule is everything has to be sort of um, methodological atheism. We have to assume that there are, that, that, that the material universe is a, um, to use the technical philosophical term, causally closed. Everything has to be explained, cause and effect within a closed system where there are only physical causes and effects. Now, that rule is a metaphysical claim because you can't empirically prove that everything has to be empirical. So that logical positivism, that idea that everything has to be material, was rejected by atheistic Western philosophers well over half a century ago because it's self-contradictory. If you say everything has to be empirically proved, you can't prove that claim empirically because it would be a ridiculous case of circular reasoning. Anyway, I'm kind of running through very quickly philosophy, but the point here is that Brahman's been around a very long time. And as far as dating the Upanishads, the system they use is obviously based on all kinds of uh, unjustifiable assumptions, or I would say presumptions. And uh, I'm, I, I'm going to, you know, based on my experiences, my realizations, I'm going to, I'm going to stick with Krishna on this one. But I have a question, uh, sir. Would you like to, uh, uh, any historian which you would like to suggest while studying European feudalism, like the likes of Mark Bloch and other historians that bring the Marxist perspective? That yesterday marked the birth anniversary of Marx. So any other perspective from? Yeah, I think, I, think, I, think, I, yeah. I think the Marxist perspective perspective is a disaster because what history has shown is that economic Forces are not the only thing that motivates human beings at all. And so I think nowadays, at least in the West, among scholars, the Marxist perspective is not considered to be a complete, accurate explanation of human behavior or, or human history. And as far as your question, I don't really, yeah, I, I personally think Marx made a lot of huge blunders, including uh, explicitly justifying genocide, so which was taken seriously by Stalin and Mao. And, uh, the, you know, Stalin and Mao killed between 10 and 20 times more people than Hitler. So, you know, a, a, an ideology which results in the murder of, you know, 10 to 20 times more people than Hitler, I, I would not recommend to anyone.